Are there any announcements this morning before we get started? I Janice? Um, I would just like to thank uh, Kathy Naples for all of her work this uh, past ca uh, academic year on our MP uh, seminar series. So please join me. I have one too. So for investigators that are in the FDS Center, don't forget we have a retreat on Monday. If you have an RSVP, please do so to Kathy or Kathy. I'm not going to catch <laughs> At the farm. Yeah, at Squire Valley Farm. Any other announcements? I have one before we get started. Um, this is something new, and I hope you'll all bear with me, but um, in the APT Center, we've decided to start a new tradition, and that's to identify an investigator of the year who embodies principles of service, education, and academics. And this year, uh, we've decided to honor Pedram Masheni. So Pedram, if you can come up here. Uh, about, about 15 people in the world see our annual report, but um, that's sort of the only public venue besides this we have to make this announcement. So Pedram was featured prominently and uh, people in Washington will know who he is, and I think we all do from his talk uh, a couple months ago. So, Pedram, thanks for your contributions, and uh, he's a little modest, but I'll brag about him. He just got a big award from the Department of Defense to continue the cortical reorganization work he's been doing with Randy Nuda. So, thanks, Pedram. Chris can show you how to mount that on the wall in your office. <laughs> All right, we'll get started now with the seminar. And this is the last seminar of uh, this academic year. And it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Um, Paolo Bonato did his undergraduate training in electrical engineering in Turin and his graduate training in Rome. And about 14 years ago, came to the States uh, for a nine-month tour uh, in Boston, and he's been there ever since. So um, we're lucky to have him here today. Uh, Paolo is uh, an assistant professor in the Department of PM&R at Harvard Medical School and uh, a member of the affiliated faculty at Harvard MIT uh, Division of Health Sciences and Technology. We'll see what his research interests are for the rest of the hour this morning. Um, but he has been, been the director of the Gate Analysis Laboratory at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital and really one of the, uh, one of the motivating forces behind uh, the incorporation of wearable technologies in rehabilitation. Uh, he has been a member of or still is a member of the IEEE EMBS uh, Administrative Committee and a past chair of the Technical Committee on Wearable biomedical sensors and systems. So without any further delay, Dr. Bonato. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really glad that the uh, um, talk was not canceled despite the, the results of the game last night. But just to let you know, <laughs> I have no responsibility. I'm too short to play basketball. so. It's <laughs> There is no way that's my responsibility. And in fact, uh, I'm really keen of soccer. That's, uh, I'm not into basketball at all. And you will forget um, um, that I'm from Boston in a few minutes because I don't have a Bostonian accent at all. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so it's really a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for inviting me and for the um, nice introduction. Um, contrary to Italian tradition, I'll try to stick with the time uh, schedule. And, uh, just wave if by any chance um, uh, I take a bit too much time and uh, I'll just uh, cut it short. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure being here and it's um, a very uh, much a pleasure doing what I was uh, told to do last night, which is to give you an overview of, uh, of our uh, research program, which uh, it's uh, something um, all researchers obviously enjoy, just tell you and, uh, about their activities. So um, I'll give um, 
these in uh, overall introductions, essentially, uh, introduction to um, our research activities. And I'll um, keep it essentially to a level that is uh, suitable for both of you who have a clinical background versus those of you who have a technical background. Um, but just to kind of uh, fine tune myself, could you just raise your hand if your background is clinical? Okay, excellent. And do I need to assume that everybody else is an engineer? Raise your hand if you're an engineer. Okay, 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 okay. Excellent, very good. Um, so what we do in my lab at Spalding is that we essentially focus on uh, technology uh, to either monitor or facilitate um, uh, movement in patients with uh, mobility limiting conditions. But the idea of uh, uh, feeding that information back or improving mobility, as, uh, as I just mentioned, through the use of technology uh, in the clinical decision uh, making process. And what you see here is experiments that, uh, uh, it's a video clip of an experiment that in fact uh, I ran shortly after moving to Spalding in 2002, um, in which we assess uh, patients uh, in uh, a a simulated kitchen type of, uh, or simulated apartment type of settings in which we were looking at capturing uh, activities and characteristics of motor patterns that are associated with the performance of activities uh, of daily uh, living in patients uh, after a stroke. Uh, we use in uh, our patient our patient uh, type of settings what uh, the technology that uh, I'm pretty sure 99% of you are really familiar with, which is uh, camera-based systems. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the technology, you essentially attach reflective markers uh, on anatomical landmarks or through clusters to different body segments and uh, from reference systems that you attach uh, to these systems of uh, markers, you uh, create uh, references that are attached to the bony. Uh, to, to the bones, and therefore uh, you can uh, estimate angular displacements in the kinetics of uh, the different joints. Uh, because our focus is uh, mostly from a clinical point of view on the pediatric population, we do um, clinical evaluations which are typically pre-surgical evaluations in children with cerebral palsy for Children's Hospital in Boston. Uh, we run typically in two problems. Uh, actually performing these type of evaluations for a reason that's non-technical at all, which is the fact that kids actually like to poke with markers. And if you imagine that you are associated, in fact, the reference system uh, that you are trying to attach to the bone to a cluster of markers that you have on the different body segments, it's pretty intuitive the fact that you start moving them around and the system needs to be recalibrated, not to mention that uh, the preparation procedure is not uh, uh, kind of welcomed by, uh, by children most of the times. And so we have been very, very interested in um, developing uh, markerless uh, um, techniques, so techniques that actually leverage image uh, processing uh, technology uh, to uh, reconstruct uh, trajectories of movement. And we have collaborated with a number of groups. This is video clips uh, from uh, one of the uh, groups we collaborate with in Rome, uh, led by Dr. Uh, Professor D'Alessio, who is my former PhD advisor, uh, with whom I kept um, in great contact. And I have students kind of flowing from Italy um, to Boston, as long as the ashes are not in between. <laughs> that works. Um, and these are grossly the type of techniques that you um, uh, leverage um, when uh, you attempt actually to uh, use this type of technology. And we roughly, just to give a sense of how the work is organized, categorize them into two large groups, one in which you're essentially identifying 
spots on the skin or you have texture, uh, texture on the garments that you are uh, tracking, which is what we call point tracking, and another large uh, bucket, if you will, of uh, uh, technologies that are associated with taking the cloud of points that's as, uh, associated, in fact, with the different body segments, and uh, either doing silhouette tracking or associating some sort of geometric model uh, to these uh, uh, cloud of points. And this is work uh, that mostly my lab was done by uh, Mitsuo Smith, uh, who came uh, to Boston for about a year during his postdoc. Uh, we also uh, collaborated with David de Mijeran, people who do imaging. Uh, they might be familiar with him. It uh, used to be at MIT. He moved to the private sector uh, recently. Um, but bottom line, you know, these uh, technologies are very, very interesting, unfortunately not ready uh, for clinical applications as yet, since the uh, accuracy of these techniques is not there as yet uh, to satisfy the requirements of our clinical applications. However, um, even if we manage to succeed, which uh, I, I assume sooner or later we will, and if we don't, someone else will do. There is, in fact, uh, even companies that are coming up with some of these uh, products. We, in fact, have collaborated with a company in New York City. It's called Organic Motion uh, that does a bit uh, of this type of work. Um, but uh, even if um, uh, our group or other groups actually succeeded in delivering technology that's suitable for this type of uh, monitoring without the use of reflective markers, still the assessments will be limited to the laboratory setting. And people who are in physical medicine and rehabilitation, and people in rehabilitation in general, are obviously interested not just in assessing the performance or, or assessing in general, uh, functions and uh, levels of impairment in a clinical setting, but they are interested in figuring out what's the impact of their intervention in the real life of the individuals. And so we got focused several years ago on what was at that point in time an emerging technology, wearable technology. I started it was when I was in fact at Boston University uh, about 10 years ago now. And we identify what are now established as the two major types of technologies that are used in wearable technology, e-textile and wireless technology, wireless sensor technology, as the two components that we were going to leverage in order to implement projects in which we were going to do monitoring of patients in the home and community settings. And that's what this slide, slide um, uh, intends to capture. So we have patients essentially that are monitored uh, through the use of a sensor suit or wireless sensors that can of uh, different nature according to the application that we're interested into. And then through an access point or cell phone type of technology, uh, we have uh, remote access to the data that we're collecting from these uh, individuals. According to the application, uh, things might be as simple as um, taking a docking station where uh, the data logger is going to sit at night. We're just going to grab the data uh, from there through an access point. Or even in applications where it's not necessary for us to have continuous access to the data, we're just going to be happy sort of downloading the data uh, in an outpatient setting when, in fact, patients come to Spalding for their evaluation. So that's what we envision uh, in the future, if you will. And that's the reason why I often use some slide, this slide, uh, to convey the concept. And because we have a lot of gigs here, a lot of engineers, I'm sure you're familiar with the doc uh, at Sick Bay from Enterprise, which is uh, this individual. And uh, if you're not, if you're in an older generation, then you must be a Star Trek person. <laughs> and so you're familiar with what's happening here. When you go to Sick Bay, uh, you have no such thing as a physical examination or running lab tests and things of that nature, but the uh, doctor is basically scanning the person with this fabulous device that we have actually a patent application pending on. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but through scanning, it actually knows exactly what's going on with the pathology and what needs to be uh, done since the diagnosis is right obvious, uh, uh, right after the, the scanning is done. 
And uh, this actually uh, captures more or less what we envision to do over the years because in fact, if we have the capability of monitoring people over extended periods of time, then when they come to the clinical setting, it's possible for us, it, it, at least um, in the future will be possible, we believe, uh, to just download data at the same time when uh, the uh, traditional tools to actually examine a patient are going to be used. And what I'm going to do in the next 15 minutes or so, uh, which is the first portion of the presentation, I'm going to give you an example that I think captures why uh, this type of approach is uh, useful. And the example that I'm going to focus on is um, the adjustment of medications in patients with uh, Parkinson's disease. So the application here is the one of titrating medications in late stage Parkinson's disease, where um, you have a target population, which is fairly large. Unfortunately, about 3% of the population about 65 years of age has Parkinson's, uh, which is a large number. Uh, Parkinson's, for those of you who don't have a medical background or you're not familiar uh, with the pathology, is associated with dopamine deficiency, um, which causes um, characteristic motor features. Uh, the most common is uh, tremor, which are the one I'm sure everybody is uh, familiar with. Uh, Parkinsonian tremor is about four to seven hertz. And uh, there are also other uh, symptoms uh, that are obvious in terms of motor characteristics, such as bradykinesia, which is essentially slowness of movement, which is uh, marked by actually sort of absence of volitional movement by the patient. Rigidity, which is when a patient opposes to the movement imposed by another person externally. Um, and in the uh, late stages, you have impairments of the uh, uh, postural. Uh, uh, control. Um, unfortunately, uh, the disease is, or the symptoms are managed properly only in the f early phases of the uh, diseases. And with time, what you have is the development of motor fluctuation cycles. So in between medication intakes, uh, which are represented here in the diagram, you have uh, sort of a uh, roller coaster, if, if you will, type of situation in which um, tremor is going to be effectively attenuated uh, by um, the uh, pharmaceutical, by the, 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 the drug intervention, if you will, by the um, intake of levodopa, carbidopa, typically. Um, but you're going to have symptoms and motor complications that are actually going to pop up. And as opposed to be constant over time, they change their severity very significantly uh, between two medication intakes. Now, this is problematic. Uh, for a number of reasons. The first one is that unfortunately the patient doesn't have, or patients in general do not have, a good perception of their motor status. And, and so when you look into uh, their ability of reporting severity of symptoms and motor complication, <coughs> that's uh, fairly poor. Um, now you could do a direct observation, which is in fact uh, what uh, you do from time to time. You just set up a nurse. Um, for a nurse to work with the patient and do an observation over a uh, motor fluctuation cycle. The problem with that is that unfortunately uh, a motor, motor fluctuation cycle is determined by the medication it takes. So you're looking into several hours of observation. So this is not very practical and not very compatible with our healthcare system where it's very difficult obviously to assign a nurse to work one-to-one -one with a patient for about five to six hours, right? And so uh, this is basically not working, but on the other hand, it looks like this could be a really good application for wearable technology where the idea is, well, why don't we just attach a wristwatch type of units uh, or you know, wireless straps to different body segments and we monitor over time the characteristics of movements and what if we actually manage to uh, infer from characteristics of the output of these sensor 
uh, that we are attaching to different body segments. The severity of symptoms and motor complications. Could we, in fact, reconstruct these uh, trajectories of changes that occur over time? And that's the project we embarked into about seven years ago. And we're now to the end of the second phase of funding. We got funded by NINDS uh, originally to do this type of work, which is more or less uh, the majority of what we're going to show you uh, today in the next few slides. And then more recently by the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And I'm going to show you quickly what um, they supported us um, to do. Um, but the concept is fairly simple. We took uh, essentially the standard, um, uh, the clinical standard for the evaluation of the severity of symptoms and motor complications, which is the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale. There is sections that actually are associated with the termination of uh, motor symptoms and complications, sections three and four, uh, that we use. So we got a neurologist and uh, our clinical collaborators to work with us and evaluate patients over time. And then we had two phases of the study, one in which we got patients in a laboratory setting and um, uh, match essentially the scores assigned by clinicians to, uh, uh, through the analysis of data collected using wearable sensors. And a second phase that I'm just going to into uh, at the very um, end of this section of the section of the presentation in which we do actually assessments in the home. Uh, and community settings. So how does this work? Well, we take the items of the uh, UPDRS motor examination section, which are the ones that are shown in, in this slide. So you have what is fairly typical in a neuro, uh, neurological type of situation where you have patients performing different motor tasks. And it might be as easy as in, you know, a finger uh, to nose type of task or, or tapping uh, with your lower uh, limbs or opening and closing um, your uh, hand and, and things of that nature. And there is a scoring system that's associated with that, which looks into uh, coordination of movement uh, speed of movement and things of that nature. So for those of you who haven't actually worked with these uh, type of patients, uh, here there are a couple of examples. So what you see here is an evaluation of uh, bradykinesia at two points in time. And our objective, just to keep ourselves focused, is essentially to reconstruct this, the time course of the severity of bradykinesia over time, which is what is represented here. And this severity is obviously captured by the height of these bars that we have on the bottom side of the plot. And what you need to capture are the things that you can see in these two video clips. You see the range of movement changes over time uh, from uh, the time when the patient was uh, more severely affected by, and versus less severely affected. And you see uh, the lack of coordination on the right and left side of the body that you want to capture as well. And you do, in fact, capture with this type of um, evaluation from a clinical point of view. Uh, this is uh, in a uh, case of uh, uh, dyskinesia. Uh, what you want to observe is the left side of the body, so just neglect uh, for a second the actual movement of the patient, so the actual motor task that the patient is performing. And just look at the left side of the body. You see high frequency or relatively high frequency components. For those of you who do microwaves, this is probably not very high frequencies, right? But this is four to seven hertz. Whereas you see uh, later on, uh, when this kinesia actually develops after medication intake, uh, tremor is gone, so the high frequency component is gone, but you have this sort of riding uh, type of movement, which is much uh, lower frequency. So, and it's sort of pseudo-periodic in nature. We're not going to discuss sort of the time series characteristics of these, uh, but uh, because we will lose totally our clinicians and also because that would lead to a separate type of presentation. But is there a chance um, that by using simple accelerometer, accelerometers, we could actually capture uh, the uh, changes that in movement patterns that I just showed in uh, the previous slides. And I'm going to try not to be excessively technical. I'm just going to give you a couple of uh, quick examples. The first one uh, to answer these questions, which is obviously the question that we had in mind when we started the project, is just to show you simple raw accelerometer data. Um, so I just show you 
two examples from two different patients. And the first one was performing these alternated hand movements, so pronation, supination type of movements of the forearm. And what you see up here, in fact, are data collected during, uh, recorded during um, uh, those uh, intervals that were captured by the video clips from the first patient. And uh, the accelerometer, accelerometers were positioned on the forearms, right and left of that person. And you can see in the off uh, medication stage where you had a type of uh, slowness of movement on the left side of the screen, that there is no clear uh, periodicity in your uh, time series, so in the data that you are gathering from the accelerometers. And the uh, range of your output is fairly limited compared to the right hand side. And if you remember the video clip, the person was moving more comfortably at a higher speed with larger range of movement, and you can see how the accelerometers are actually capturing these. The same for the second patient, where we had essentially no activity on the lower extremities, which is where the accelerometers were positioned for these uh, plots in the uh, lower part of, of the screen. And so in the off medication stage, you only have very high frequency uh, components. That, uh, and these data are filtered so that actually that component is not obvious. But as um, the uh, medication has its effect, then that component is gone. And what you see is these bursts of activity which are associated with the riding movements that I showed you before. So this is very qualitative, and for those of you who have an engineering background, it's, it's very, very basic, right? But you might still not believe that we can actually capture these things. So I'll have a couple of slides that are a tiny bit more technical. Um, so the first slide uh, shows you, uh, or has the aim of showing you, that in fact, um, even before you run the proper procedures to analyze the data. You can figure out that your data is capturing these uh, different aspects of movements that are associated with your observations that you perform at different point in time, points in time. And the way I'm going to do it through this plot uh, is by showing you, in fact, uh, that there is uh, patterns that are associated with uh, this type of uh, modifications in the biomechanics of motion. And how do we do that? Well, how did we actually got uh, to these type of plots? Well, uh, stay with me just for a minute. And uh, let me ask you to focus on what we have on the left side of the screen here and forget about what we have on the right side for a second. So what we have here, it's the output of a, a technique that's called SAMOS mapping uh, that essentially consists in taking a um, multi-dimensional feature space, which are all the features that we have extracted essentially from the accelerometers that I show you, time series that I just showed you before. We do segmentation, and for each segment, we estimate a number of different features, right? Uh, we take segments at different points in time, uh, so multiple segments within each trial, if you will, and then we take trials every 30 minutes so that we can actually follow what's happening with the patient. Now, when you do a projection for these, from this multi-dimensional space to a reduced dimension space, uh, for instance, in this case, only two dimensions, right? The beauty of this technique is that it preserves, essentially, the ratio between the distances that you had among samples in the multi-dimensional space. So if you look at this light blue point versus this magenta one versus this yellow one, the relative distance between these two points and the magenta and yellow points in the two dimension is essentially the distance that you have. The ratio is the same that you have in uh, the multidimensional feature space. So it gives you essentially a sense of where your samples are going to be. And why is this significant? It's significant because if you use a color map that captures when these samples were taken in time, what you can see is that there is a pattern actually in the projection that basically tells you that you can follow the time course of these changes over time. But even more interesting is the fact that if you now move your focus on the right hand side and we use a color map 
that's actually associated with the severity of the particular muscle complication that we're focusing on, which is this kinesia. You can see there are clusters or areas of the plot that are associated with dots of different colors. And these are obviously what in cluster analysis would be indicated as clusters. And you do have, therefore, a specific pattern uh, content that's captured by these features that's then reflected in the fact that if you look at the multidimensional space or its projection, as is shown here, the dots essentially end up in different points. So uh, for those of you who are interested and just look at these plots and say, well, but you do have overlap, um, the reason why that happens is, uh, I think, fairly obvious to those of you who actually have clinical uh, background, which is the fact that the severity of symptoms and motor complication changes gradually over time. And in fact, if we had the time to go over uh, the time course of these changes, you would actually appreciate the fact that these points that are sort of in between clusters, they do correspond to uh, points in time, in fact, if you remap them in time, where the severity was changing. And so if you have a transition between a severity of one and a severity of two, those points are kind of in between and they do correspond to the sample that was taken as the patient was evolving from one uh, level of severity to the other. So bottom line, we can actually reconstruct on the basis, or we have hoped to reconstruct on the basis of these uh, plots and these cluster analysis, the time course of the severity of this kinesia in this case. You can do the same for all the other uh, symptoms and motor complications, and then you can use uh, whatever classifier you uh, think it's most appropriate, and then compare them and do things of that nature. Um, we publish these uh, type of uh, results uh, numerous times. The um, with variations on the type of algorithms and the type of approach that we have taken. Our last publication on the transactions of information in biomedicine and technology uh, in November actually shows how uh, some of these features can be estimated directly on the nodes of the body sensor network, which I'm going to get into in a second. Uh, but this plot actually provides you with demonstration, if you will, as opposed to just a suggestion, as the plots that I showed you before, that uh, these uh, symptoms and motor complications, they can actually, or their severity can be estimated reliably. And in fact, what you have here on the right hand side of the slide is the uh, prediction error that's associated with the use of these accelerometer data and feature extraction uh, procedures and uh, pattern recognition uh, task, uh, which in this specific instance was achieved by using support vector machines with different types of kernels, etc. Um, it shows you the prediction error for tremor, bradykinesia, and dyskinesia. On the x-axis, you have the different motor tasks that are part of our evo evaluation, so different types of uh, movements that patients have to perform. And as expected, for each of these uh, tasks, you do have estimation errors that are uh, different. And uh, the severity of symptoms and motor complications in this case was estimated on the basis of the individual uh, items, which basically tells you that um, there are tasks that are better than others, obviously, to, to capture these uh, uh, severity of symptoms and motor complications, which is certainly not surprising. But more importantly, it tells you that the prediction error is very uh, low. In fact, if you look at the average value, you are, for the majority of the tasks, below 5%. And if you think that uh, the use of this type of scale is typically associated with a 5 to 10%, uh, Interrated reliability, then essentially what we do with the system is as good as getting another clinician to provide a second opinion on the evaluation of the severity of symptoms and motor complications in a patient. So we're basically mimicking things uh, that would be done by a physician pretty well. And why is that of interest to uh, you know clinical personnel? Because we can capture that over time, over a long uh, period of time, which would be impractical to do uh, from a clinical point of view. Now, how can we possibly do it? Well, we need to have technology that's unobtrusive enough 
to actually be able to do this in the home setting. And uh, we uh, developed this uh, platform um, with Intel. They used to have an R&D group in Boston. Ben Kreuz is the engineer, actually, who, who developed um, the hardware uh, for this platform. This is called Shimmer. Um, they span off then a company it's called Shimmer Research in Boston. It's a company that we have a collaboration with, and we did receive uh, funding from Intel. I don't know how we do with CME things, but I'm used just to disclose potential conflicts of interest as, as I go. And so uh, Intel was gracious enough to get us into a gift program. So we did uh, a project of, with them um, to actually characterize the use of this technology in another patient population. We did that in COPD. So not directly in, in this area. Uh, but I just wanted to mention it um, just in case it's perceived as a potential conflict of interest. Um, but this is a platform that was developed a while ago. And at the time it was developed, I think it was uh, very innovative. So Ben Curtis did a really good job. We had SD cards on, on, these, um, on these units. Uh, there was, uh, in fact, this was the first uh, platform with that type of characteristic. We had bought Bluetooth and Zigbee. Uh, on this platform or a Thunder 2.15.4, um, a, a chipcom uh, radio, in fact, uh, that allows us wireless connectivity. And then we got Matt Welsh to do essentially all the firmware development. Matt came from uh, Berkeley. And we got lucky, his wife got a good job at MGH, and so he had to move. And so we managed to get him to uh, come to the um, Harvard Engineering School. He is an expert in this area, is on, uh, for those of you who do actually uh, work in this area, is on the TinyOS uh, seminar paper. Uh, TinyOS is the operating system that essentially runs uh, these type of units. So, but still, the next step is to take this technology and deploy that in the ARM setting. And that's what we have been doing with funding from the Michael J. Fox Foundation. We have asked to develop a platform to get robot access to these units and therefore enable this type of evaluations uh, in the home. And this is a simulated session by the two PhD students who are actually working on the project, Borong and Shamal. Uh, Borong is here and Shamal is pretending to be the physician who is examining the patient. And what you will see in a second is that we can get, uh, we can capture essentially uh, the output of accelerometers remotely uh, using this type of interface. For those of you who have an engineering background that might be interested in some of the details, this was developed originally in Python. And uh, it turns out that Borong found out that you can actually get uh, uh, a library of Skype functions that you can compile within Python. And so what you see here is actually running Skype next to uh, the application that was developed. We did that first because we figure, um, given that we do clinical work, that it was a good idea to start um, setting this up with a VPN connection. But we have now a Flash application as well that does exactly the same job. And so essentially what this tells you is that we have the capability of monitoring patients using this type of technology uh, and assess uh, the severity of symptoms, amount of complications, and potentially uh, facilitate, therefore, the titration of medications in, in this patient population. We have applied this technology to uh, um, the uh, refinement, if you will, or adjustment of settings of the brain stimulation. For those of you who are interested in that area, we published a type of work on pervasive computing a couple of years ago. I think that's uh, a very promising area of application in which uh, we're looking essentially into following patients through the continuum between late stage Parkinson's disease and DBS interventions for those who are actually eligible uh, for this uh, uh, type of uh, uh, intervention. And we have uh, pursued a number of different clinical applications, which I'm just not going to dive into um, in order to stick with the time uh, frame, uh, timetable that, that we have. But something that I want to mention, which is sort of the second section of the talk, which is a bit shorter uh, than the first one, so don't be concerned we're going to be able to go through uh, uh, within reasonable um, um, 
time. Um, something that I want to bring up is that um, what I just showed you, even in the simple application or relatively simple application, to monitoring changes in the severity of symptoms and multiple complications in Parkinson is not actually addressing the need for gathering all pieces of information that we are interested in. Too. And in fact, uh, certainly if you have a clinical background, but possibly if you had, um, uh, if my slide on what you need to capture at the beginning when I talk about Parkinson, capture your attention. <laughs> Uh, you have probably noticed that one thing that we don't capture is uh, the severity of rigidity over time. And one difficulty with that is that rigidity, as I defined it earlier, is essentially how strongly the patient is opposing to a movement that's imposed by um, another individual. Now, you could, in fact, we have attempted to, but we have actually, uh, we're not done with the project as yet, so we're not sure that that's uh, it's going to work. You could infer rigidity from other things that you can capture in the field. And one thing that's interesting to do, which we have been doing with Bob Hillman at MGH, is to actually capture speech data and see if we can infer uh, the severity of rigidity on the basis of changes um, in the characteristics of speech. But the most obvious way to go would be to have a really, really simple, possibly low-cost robot, not complicated as the robot that you see here, uh, which comes from uh, a group uh, in Japan, in Tokyo, uh, where they're expert in, in developing this type of technology that, in fact, interacts with the patient and allows us to perform this type of evaluations outside of a clinical setting. Uh, is that realistic? Well, we're not sure uh, as yet. We're not sure that that's the best way um, to go about it. But there is definitely a lot of interest for the use of robotic uh, technologies in the uh, rehabilitation uh, area. And part of the interest is related to the assessment, but even more is actually associated with the possibility of improving function in patients uh, by leveraging um, uh, robotics. So what I want to show you very quickly is a bit of our work in the area of robotics for upper and lower extremity. Um, uh, uh, rehabilitation. In upper extremities, the situation that um, we face at this point in time is that there is still a bit of a uh, debate about the effectiveness of uh, the interventions, whether or not they actually have a significant impact on function in the individuals and quality of life. And we think that partially um, on the basis of the analysis of the literature, and you have a few reviews that are mentioned here, it's emerging the fact that one of the issues that's not addressed properly is the one of uh, providing a platform that's suitable for training of distal functions. And so what I'm going to show you quickly is how we took actually some sensing technology, which is wearable technology, and we combine that with a commercial available robotic system uh, for upper extremity rehabilitation. The other area that we think is uh, very important uh, to uh, develop is one that actually allows you uh, to gain a better understanding of the mechanisms that underlie um, motor recovery. And uh, this is an obvious uh, area of, of development. Uh, what it might be not necessarily super obvious is what type of technology we actually need in order to be able to make some strides in that area. And the approach that we have taken is the one that a few other groups have taken, which is the one of looking into the development of systems that are fMRI compatible that actually allow us to perform uh, relatively complex experiments in a magnet. And this is the implementation by Dr. Mavroidis, one of our collaborators of a system that is uh, based on the use of uh, electrological fluids, um, which has the capability of actuation as well. I'm not just going to, again, go into the details 
of, of the project because it would take a bit too much time. But essentially, the platform that we have right now, it allows us to actually do bot pronation, uh, grasp and release, as is shown in the device here, uh, as well as pronation, supination movements uh, in a magnet, which allows us to uh, assess what type of adaptations to int the intervention we have. But le let me stick with the first example, which is more uh, sensor-based. Um, so the inspiration of the project is the observation that I just made that uh, systems that are available at this point in time, they don't truly really address the need for focusing on uh, hand functions. And so what we thought was to take technology developed by colleagues in Europe, this is all technology developed by the Dr. De Rossi's group uh, in Pisa. Uh, they're excellent partners in terms of uh, their work in the area of material science. If you have an interest for this area, you're probably familiar with the My Heart uh, project. It's a major project that was wrapped up uh, recently by the European Commission and supported by the European Commission. And it was led by Philips and they had a component that was associated with the need for monitoring movement patterns in patients in the human community settings that in fact use this type of technology, which is um, conductive elastomer type of technology that you can print on lycra and cotton fabric. This is very interesting because it's very inexpensive, uh, but um, it's tough to, to use and so, uh, when Dr. De Rossi came to our group a few years ago uh, with this type of technology and asked us for an opinion concerning an application of this technology, we decided to go for uh, manufacturing uh, gloves uh, with um, the printed um, sensing components on the dorsal side of the hand to do simple monitoring of grasp and release that was then combined with the robotics. We did a characterization of the sensor technology. Um, what you see here is the output from these sensors. It's a voltage output. What you do is that um, you inject a small current into the sensing element. The sensing element changes its resistance as a stretch or release uh, in association with movements of, of the of grasp and release in the end. And you have a modulation uh, as a function of the angular displacements at the different joints. And if you look at elements across different joints and you calibrate, in fact, um, the uh, sensing components by using a camera-based system, as I show in the previous slide, uh, then you can actually have plots that show the characteristics of these sensors. So their output, as I just mentioned, as a function of the angular uh, displacement that you measure at different joints. So for those of you who are familiar with sensor technology, you can see uh, changes there associated with the speed of movement, uh, which are represented by the different sets of plots here. And you have a stereosis that's associated with nonlinearities uh, that are inherent to the sensor. But can you still actually do a good job uh, estimating hand aperture, which is what our target is at this point in time? And we decided to use a very sophisticated uh, piece of technology to do the calibration. We built wooden cones. It comes across as a laughable solution, but we think it's a smart solution, the reason being that you can actually do calibrations that are both static and dynamic at a very low cost. So we're very much in line with uh, cutting costs in the healthcare system here. And uh, the reason why that works is because obviously um, what you're trying to do here is to capture the size of the object that the person is uh, grasping, which is corresponds to the diameter of the section of the cone at each uh, point along the cone. And then you want to see what happens when, in fact, you change dynamically uh, uh, the uh, length, if you will, of the stress that's exerted on the sensors that you're opening and closing your hand. And so that's simulated by simply sliding your hand along the cone. So if you use a number of these sensor components that are attached to the dorsal side of the end, and then you build something that's as simple as a linear regression model, this is what you get. 
on the y-axis, you have the output of the regression model, and you, on the x-axis is the uh, diameter of the cone at different points as the patients or the subjects actually go through grasping uh, the cones at different um, heights. And you, you can obviously tell that this is pretty good uh, from um, a uh, sensor output point of view. If you do this dynamically, you do expect because of the different behaviors that I showed you before, um, when you perform movements at different speeds, you do expect deviations from the uh, behavior in static conditions, but you can see here that the deviations are fairly minor, and in fact, they don't come across as a problem when you actually use the system for simple uh, feedback uh, to the individual. So what did we do? We took um, that data glove, and uh, we plug that into a commercially available system. This is the Armeo system by Ocoma. Ocoma is a Swiss company that's leader in this area. It's a company that we do have uh, received scholarships for students from, just again for the sake of uh, disclosure, potential conflicts of interest. Um, and they were kind enough to us to actually allow us uh, to um, have all the information that's necessary essentially to take the output of the GLOB, fit that output to an acquisition system, we do processing, and then we generate analog levels that we fit back to the robotic system so we can actually make it part of the interactive gaming system that's um, uh, commercially available. Um, this is a system that provides weight support. Uh, it doesn't provide active guidance in terms of actuation of the different joints, but it has been shown that recently to be effective in uh, subjects uh, post-stroke. Our experience is mostly with um, uh, TBI, and uh, I, I, we haven't seen anything published in, in that area, so if you're interested in that type of application, I don't have any slides here, again, for the sake of time, um, but I'm, we'll be more than happy after uh, the talk to share with you uh, some of the results that we got. Can you do the same for lower extremities? Certainly you can, and in fact, uh, there is a lot of robotics uh, that focuses on um, the use of technology to facilitate locomotion, which is a bit less um, obtrusive than what you see in this slide. So this is fascinating, again, uh, from Japan, but certainly not suitable for clinical applications. Is there a robotics that's already uh, present in um, on the market, if you will. And in fact, there is, if you look at simple um, modulation of viscosity in damper type of systems, this is a system that was developed by our colleagues at MIT. You heard is the leader of that group, and they design a prosthesis that's based on the use of magnetological fluids. These are ch fluids that change their viscosity as you modulate the magnetic field that's applied to them. And it was eventually commercialized by Osur. And we got a contract actually to characterize these prostheses versus other commercially available prostheses. But even more, what we are seeing uh, these days, it's more and more uh, technology that actually has the capability of allowing subjects to perform motor activities that were not possible in the past, such as um, going up a flight of stairs, step over steps, which requires uh, for the majority of the patients at least um, the uh, capability of generating torques at different joints. And again, uh, we think that this is possible because um, actuation technology is making incredible strides over the uh, past decade, but also because sensor technology and control strategies that are available at this point in time that were not available until 10 or 15 years ago, they're now mature enough to actually allow us to get into applications of this technology. Now, uh, it's a matter of fact that this technology is already commercially available. And it's a matter of fact that this technology actually combines very aggressively actuation and sensing technology. If you look at the um, uh, power knee by Osur again, which is what is shown in this uh, picture, it has the ability of allowing patients to go up a flight of stairs step over step. 
and the way it synchronizes, if you will, uh, or drives the controller um, of the prosthesis is by sensors that are embedded in the prosthesis, but also um, by capturing data using an insole that's positioned uh, in the shoe of the contralateral uh, side for um, unilateral amputees that communicates with the prosthesis through Bluetooth. And so the concept of essentially merging sensors and robotics is actually already there. Um, the concept is coming along very strongly, in my opinion, in orthotics. Uh, this is a design, again, by Hughes Group. It's based on the use of serious elastic actuators, which are essentially uh, motors in series with springs that was proposed by Gil Pratt uh, originally for this type of application. And you can see in this very simple uh, clinical case, which clinically would be addressed differently than by using a um, robotic um, orthosis, right? But you can see the level of adaptability that has been achieved in prototypes. Uh, you can see how easily uh, the system responds to increases and decreases in, in gait speed and uh, pivoting. So this is um, from Hughes lab, actually. It's not um, directly from our lab. What we contributed here was actually the uh, modeling component um, to drive uh, the controller of the system. But um, again, getting back to improving uh, functions, um, we are not looking into or we're witnessing not only the use of robotics in order to replace uh, or main function, but also in, in terms of uh, retraining functions. And the systems that are mostly uh, used at this point in time are systems that are fairly expensive, like the system as shown here, which is again a system by Ocoma, which is a company that I mentioned before, uh, that are treadmill-based systems, and that retrain ambulation uh, in this case, but in the adult and pediatric population, through essentially uh, guiding the movements of lower extremities in, in these individuals, and hopefully improving functions. So we have achieved good results, at least uh, in a certain percentage of the population. As always, in rehabilitation, we get mixed results, and then we're left with a question of how we can possibly optimize um, the intervention so that we achieve good results also in subjects who are not responded in this point in time, which is an area of great interest to us. But one of the drawbacks uh, of these uh, systems is the fact uh, that they can only be used over a very limited uh, period of time. And so, and only in the uh, inpatient or outpatient settings. And so you envision patients undergoing these type of interventions for just a few hours a week in the best case scenario. Um, and so a lot of us have been interested in using um, orthotics to actually extend the uh, therapy time, if you will, outside of the traditional uh, inpatient and outpatient settings. Uh, these are slides from a project sponsored by the National Science Foundation that I'm running with Dr. Mavroidis, in which we're using knee braces in a very specific uh, case of, of gait deviations, uh, which is uh, knee hyperextensions in uh, patients with amyparesis. And what we do is essentially we provide the ability of way bearing in subjects in which uh, for weakness or lack of trust of the affected side, patients are not actually performing appropriately, appropriately um, any flexion during stents. And we prevent through uh, in, uh, modifying uh, essentially the uh, resistance that's uh, exerted by the system, we prevent uh, people from going in hyperextensions. Now, this type of technology begs the question of do we actually really need to build these fairly sophisticated robotic systems um, to get people to ambulate and uh, relearn uh, functions um, through ambulation? 
So that's, that's a very interesting question. There is literature that suggests, in fact, that we should do that. Uh, there is also literature that suggests that we can envision exercise modalities that uh, elicit all those types of movement components that are necessary, in fact, to lead to improvements in function. This is a video clip uh, taken in my lab using Greg Bourdais's platform. Uh, we got it through Judy Deutsch, with which we ran um, a collaborative project a few years ago. We had Anat uh, Mirelman in my lab for a couple of years. She did her thesis with us, uh, her PhD thesis with us. And what she did for her thesis was, in fact, to get uh, people to play uh, with this uh, store platform, so it's a six degree of freedom platform that controls games. And through interactive gaming, uh, and so exercise that's actually elicited by the interactive gaming context, we got very significant improvements in, in function in, in these patients. Uh, we have published uh, these results on uh, stroke uh, last year, and we just came up with a paper on uh, gait and posture that shows more the effect on the biomechanics of ambulation of this type of uh, intervention. And, and, and this is our best case scenario. I just want to s say that emphatically, this is not our typical response. I just want to show you here what we uh, get when we get really lucky. And so we get really, really good results. And then uh, in the papers, you will see, as always, there's a bit uh, of a mixed bag of results. And so we have uh, patients who responded extremely well, like this one, and patients who responded more moderately. Uh, interestingly, uh, the interactive gaming component was a very crucial uh, component of training. But it's very intuitive, even if you're not into gait, uh, that the improvements that we got here, pre and post, are very significant. So technology here provides us with a number of opportunities. Um, and I'm going to wrap up uh, my talk here. But I'm just going to um, try to convey quickly without going over other projects that we're running in the lab at this point in time, that there is uh, a number of opportunities um, that are provided by technology and rehabilitation. This is an easy crowd to sell uh, the concept to. Um, but I, I want to point out um, that the wearable technology that we uh, have discussed uh, this morning has a variety of applications besides the applications to Parkinson's disease. Um, one of the applications that's very popular that uh, I often present um, to crowds where we have a significant component interest in geriatrics is um, monitoring and set up interventions to prevent falls in, the, uh, in older adults. But I hope I also convey the fact uh, that the use of sensor technology and wearable in general has a very significant potential in terms of its uh, impact on uh, the use and effectiveness of robotics to augment and recover uh, functions that relates to tasks performed by the upper and lower extremity movements. And I have uh, a few more slides here that I'm actually going to skip um, because they're essentially um, ideas about things uh, that could be done on the basis of the combinations of these technologies. What I want to do here before actually concluding the talk is to acknowledge um, uh, our funding uh, sources. Uh, we always do it, just in case we have a program director in the audience, and this is webcasted, so you never know. Uh, so we're really grateful. Uh, I'm joking, but we're obviously really grateful for um, funding that we have received from NIH and the National Science Foundation that supported the studies that I presented this morning. We get uh, DOD funding mostly through CIMIT, which is a consortium in Boston um, that started as a Harvard-MIT consortium involving uh, Draper's labs as well, and that involves Boston University at this point in time. And then we have, uh, for the projects that I mentioned today, uh, sponsorship from uh, Ocoma and Intel that actually help us um, carrying out these projects. On the right-hand side of the slide, I have actually what um, 
matters very much to me, which is the acknowledgement to uh, my um, Harvard um, team. Um, so these are all people on the top uh, portion of the slide, actually, who has, have been working in my lab on the projects uh, that I mentioned this morning. And on the bottom side is actually collaborators either from the medical school or other universities that significantly contributed to the projects that I presented. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention and invite you to send me um, an email if uh, you want additional information about any of the work that I presented today. Thank you very much. I have a token of our appreciation to Dr. Bonato. Thank you very much. His time with us this morning. Thank you. So, very nice. Yeah. Questions, and uh, the questions on for those of you watching on the web are open too. So, send an email with your questions. Sure. Um, I'm not a physicist, but I didn't understand how your data glove that you were presenting is cyber. Right, 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 right. So there is a number of commercial available systems to do exactly what we uh, have shown there. Um, the reason why we didn't necessarily like existing systems is because they tend to have the following characteristics. If they're really good, they're very expensive. If uh, they're not expensive, they tend to be not accurate at all. In this case, what we have, it's a platform that has the potential to be incredibly inexpensive because you're simply printing uh, conductive elastomers on top of uh, lycra or cotton fabric that you can customize very easily by taking a simple scan of the hand of the patient or anthropometric measures so that the sensors can actually be positioned properly at, across the different joints. And uh, because of the technology that I just mentioned could be potentially uh, made commercially available for a cost that's certainly uh, below uh, $10 a pair. Uh, and therefore, we think that this is incredibly attractive from our point of view for a clinical application because it can be individualized, it can be extremely low cost, and uh, therefore it can be uh, considered not just at the level that we're using right now, we're basically customize things on an individual basis, but we could even have a disposable, uh, which is incredibly attractive from a clinical point of view. So it's not as if the technology that we have there uh, delivers something that's not uh, achieved or delivered by any other uh, uh, platforms, but we think that the combination of uh, relatively good accuracy and the very low cost is fairly unique. So so one thing that I know would be very interesting is to be able to understand the relationship between the kinematics and the underlying muscle activity um, that's going on. Have you thought about integrating I mean, maybe simple surface EMG sensors? Because I saw the glove comes all the way up and comes to the elbow. Right. Right, 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 right. So that's definitely a possibility. The clip that I show you, the examples that I show you, they're actually um, a former version of the design that we're using at this point in time. Um, if you have clinical experience, you know that that form factor is really not suitable for uh, in clinical practice, right? And so it was a good way for us to start as a proof of concept. And then we got a person working with Marita Canina, um, Venere Ferraro, she came to my lab uh, for about nine months, and we redesigned that completely so that donning and doffing it is actually uh, fairly easy right now. Whereas with that version of the glove, which we use in the very, very first uh, uh, set of experiments, uh, I wouldn't say that it was excruciating pain to go through the process of donning and doffing it, but it took like 10 minutes uh, to do that, which is not acceptable from a clinical point of view. So the design that we have right now actually has clips um, that allow you to firm uh, the glove on the dorsal side of the hand. It's open on the palmar side of the hand, which is very good in terms of uh, proprioception. And uh, it has straps that actually allow you to tighten the glove so that the subject can do it with the contralateral side. Now, that doesn't address the EMG question, which is a very good question. And what we are interested in is two, uh, two aspects of it. One is to use it as part of the exercise process. There is uh, technology out there, I 
found out actually a review just a few years ago about the uh, use of EMG in combination with exoskeletons, um, which uh, is definitely of interest to us. But even more, we're interested in understanding underlying uh, mechanisms that are associated with motor recovery. And so we were lucky enough to get the challenge grant uh, led by Emilio Bizzi at MIT. And we're working with them to understand, uh, in the attempt to understand how synergies are actually, um, how they modify over time in response to an intervention. And so it's, it's definitely an area that we have an interest for, but I don't have results at this point in time to show you. In your presentation, you didn't mention much about how do you assess the accuracy or more the validation or viability of these devices, and to what extent uh, do you focus your energies in, in doing that? Because obviously when we start using these things, we propose to use it, for example, let's say we want to uh, uh, show real life activity uh, with an NIH map. That's a question that's gonna be asked. Where is your psychometric data to say this is really reflecting what it says is reflecting and it's reproducible? Can you tell me what process you go through in your lab uh, to assess right. that? Sure. So the approach that we have taken is the one of having uh, clinical evaluations performed in parallel uh, to the use of the technology. And what the technology does is essentially matching clinical scores that we get from uh, the clinicians, right? So in the case that I show, what we have uh, what I demonstrated essentially, but not extensively in terms of validations um, in, in these slides that I show you, but I would be happy to send you a bit more uh, literature on that, is that we can match these uh, profiles of severities of uh, Parkinsonian symptoms that are the output of the evaluation through visual observation just down through U the UPDRS. But something that might be of more interest to you is that we have done the same in stroke. And that's, uh, that was done with funding from NICHD in which we took a series of uh, uh, motor tasks that we borrow from the Wolf motor test. And we use the same type of instrumentation. And then we predicted um, different aspects, essentially, of um, uh, clinical scores, or different types, I'm sorry, of, of clinical scores uh, that were, in fact, uh, obtained by uh, clinicians through examinations of patients, such as um, the assessment of quality movement is associated with the Wolf motor test, um, the Fugmeyer, the Shadok McMaster, et cetera. And so the validation is, from this specific point of view, uh, related to taking uh, the technology and observing whether or not by um, extracting information from movement components that are associated with uh, functional activities, we can infer uh, clinical scores that will be assigned uh, to a patient by, through a clinical evaluations uh, using uh, clinical, uh, standard clinical tools. That's essentially the way we're doing. Now you could uh, envision proposing a package that's more inclusive. Uh, that's the Alan Jedi type of approach, right? And in fact, we have been working with Alan, we have a pending application right now, to do a better integration of the two technologies. So it's a very good point, the one that you're bringing up. I hope uh, you were on the review panel that actually uh, evaluated that application. <laughs> I know you're not, that's why I can't joke about it. <laughs> we do have a, uh, a web question. Given a single accelerometer, what is the highest yield measurement strategy in PD patients? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So. What I haven't shown here is what we do in terms of what we call sensor reduction, uh, which is, you know, can we get away with a very limited uh, number of sensors attached to the body? Because um, the question is probably coming from a bit of clinical experience where the uh, person knows um, that it's very cumbersome to go through the use of multiple sensors I have, I've shown in the picture. And so in the publications that I mentioned earlier, we have actually gone through the exercise of essentially dropping uh, a certain number of sensors and do multiple combinations out of the uh, nine sensors that I show we use in PD. 
And what you have is a compromise between um, right accuracy and uh, um, number of sensors that you're using. Um, I personally uh, am more than happy if um, the person who asked that question sent me, sent me sent me an email message to actually provide some quantitative data, which I don't have in this set of slides. Um, but I personally don't think that using a single sensor would be a good strategy, simply because you are going to need necessarily for the evaluations that I showed you earlier to capture aspects that relate to movements of the upper and lower extremities. But I think that with two or three sensors, you're going to get um, a good picture of what's happening actually with uh, the patients if you pick um, the more severely affected side of the body in Parkinson's. In uh, other applications, such as in stroke, it's another story because you might be interested in monitoring the contralateral side, but most of your interest is obviously focused on the affected side. All right, I'd like to, oh, is there one more question? Last question. Um, as far as in your own Robotics compared to just conventional um, markers of neural recovery? Yeah, no, so we don't. So the um, only publication on that platform is a publication by Dr. Mavrodi's lab who developed that technology first. And then we got interested ourselves in collaborating with them to expand it to a combination of grasp and release, the way you've seen it, and pronation supination. So the system has been tested for grasp and release by Dr. Mavroidis and his team. And um, that has been published, uh, but not in combination with an intervention as yet. We decided to add the uh, pronation supination component because we are interested in figuring out the effect of training isolated components versus coordinated movements. And that's a pending application. So again, I hope you will be on that review panel because I think it's a really, really interesting question. And uh, there is nothing like that that's available at this point in time that's fMRI compatible. So um, you, know, you could envision a comparison certainly with more traditional type of technology, um, but it's not going to be fair to traditional uh, technology because uh, other systems, they don't have the ability of tracking combined movements, coordinated movements, and they don't have the actuation components with the combination of grasp and release and pronation supination, which is key, obviously, in Parkinson's because, you, uh, I'm sorry, in, in stroke, because you are targeting synergies. All right, we're, uh, we're out of time. I'd like to thank again uh, Dr. Bonato and everyone for their attention. And uh, this is the last seminar of the series, as I said earlier. So stay tuned for uh, the slate uh, for the schedule for next year. And we'll see you in September.